this is Karina from Break Fear, Find Freedom. And today we're speaking about a subject that's close to many people's hearts and hidden, I think, uh, hidden in lots of people's lives is the fear of death. And I know that sounds really dark, but is it really? Like a lot of, a lot of us, we walk through life fearing death and by fearing death, are we really fearing life? Because if we fear death, do we keep ourselves back from really experiencing this life right now? And what is death anyway, but transformation perhaps? Today, I have Tom Kelly with me and we're going to unpack the subject. So sit back and yes, I know it might be dark, but a lot of people fear death. So on that note, hello, Tom, how are you? Good, thanks, Karina. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. So what about you? Um, do you fear death? Um, I'm not sure if there is death. Of course, the death of other creatures, that's for certain. We know that. Yeah. Um, by the way, you said this could be dark. I can't imagine a moment of this conversation being dark. I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, death. I, I fear death of loved ones, of people belonging to me. Um, I've suffered the death of pets more than of people. Um, as a child, I guess I feared death a lot, and I've terrified of the death of my parents. But um, I've grown to a stage where I'm not at all sure that death really occurs for any of us, or that if and when it does occur, that we're even aware of a moment of transition. Um, we have so many hundreds, maybe tens of thousands, for all I know, accounts of so-called near-death experiences on the web we can listen to now, and they are absolutely fascinating. And most of them have certain things in common, but they, they vary amazingly. But one thing they all have in common is that the people telling them are telling them they've come back. And all of those people seem to assume that they've come back from death to the same life and that death still awaits them. Whereas, <laughs> you know what I'm going to say? <laughs> this, in, 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 if, if that was death, if they did die, then this is their afterlife. And, and who knows, maybe that's how it works. So, so that's where I come from. Um, that doesn't mean, of course, that I'm not afraid of, of misliving one or any number of lives I'm given, finite lives. I am very, very, very much conditioned to believe that you have to do your best. And I'm also conditioned to believe that your best is never ever good enough because I grew up in Western culture. So I could say that while my experiences, my so-called perhaps near death or out of body experience have taught me not to be afraid of death, like most people who've had those experiences, I am still very much afraid of not living right, um, which is paradoxical because I shouldn't be. Okay, um, I love that. And now we have to go into the subject of um, near-death experiences because it's so fascinating how um, all these, I mean, I've never had a near-death experience, but I've, I've had an out-of-body experience. And I'm wondering, like, I'm sure it's not the same, but it's probably the same experience, but it's taken to the next level. So... Tell us a bit, Tom, about your experiences, if you okay with that. It was a year and a half after my experiences when I got an email from a colleague in Ireland who described what had happened to him and called it a near-death experience that I suddenly realized, oh my goodness, what happened to me was very like that. Um, and I tried to contact him again and find out was he near death, which I presumed he was, was he in some critical situation in hospital? But I never did manage to find out. And that was back in 2009. Um, so growing up in Ireland, I wasn't familiar with the term near death experience. And this was as 08, it happened to me. I had read um, two wonderful books by John Cleese, the comedian, and Robin Skinner, one of his therapists. The first was called uh, Families and How to Survive, and the second was called Life and How to Survive. It's two wonderful books. And in one, he mentioned Maslow's peak experiences, this oceanic feelings of bliss that people 
describe, and that this supposedly was the highest level of consciousness we humans could experience. That was all I knew. So when the things happened to me, I kind of thought, well, it was like that, maybe, a peak experience. But um, I wasn't even familiar with the terms out-of-body experience or near-death experience at the time. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd heard of mystical experiences, whatever they were, and ecstatic experiences, which I think are the same. Um, when you mentioned out of body, the uh, it occurs to me that um, that that what all these experiences of alternate states of consciousness, as they're described, rightly or wrongly, have in common is that we're no longer in our minds. I think the mind chatter has completely stopped. Uh, I, I love Jill Bolte Taylor's account as a scientist and neuroanatomist of her, what she called her stroke of insight, when her language centers in her brain seemed to be affected by the uh, anomaly she'd been born with, and she suffered a, a large stroke. Um, they removed a clot about the size of a, a ping pong ball, I think, some weeks later. Um, she found herself, she said, in a silent mind. Um, maybe she found herself outside a silent mind. But when the mind stops completely, um, there is something else going on. And that's our awareness, or perhaps what people call pure consciousness, unsullied by the chatterings of the mind. And um, when people look at a gorgeous sunset, or, or some people can go into an art gallery, or look into the gaze into the eyes of a newborn baby, or an animal, or whatever, when our mind stops for that brief instant, or we see a totally new sight, and we're over, overwhelmed by beauty, um, I think we all experience that momentarily, um, however we might choose to describe it. There's a wonderful poem that begins, I think, surprised by joy, impatient as the wind, I turn to share the transport with whom, but the, it was the words were to somebody when he saw daffodils. But when we're surprised by joy or beauty, suddenly our mind just stops. We have no thoughts, no words, and we're in that state of blissful awareness. And I think all these mystical experiences, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, have that in common that the mind, the chattering mind, the language centers have just ceased. And with a silent mind, we rest in pure consciousness. Um, so I guess your out of body experiences were a little bit like that, were they? Mm, yes, it was. Well, it was for a bit, and then um, the mind came into play, and all the religious and all the, the 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 fears came into play, and it was like, "Whoa, what are you doing? This is ungodly. This is from from Satan or whatever it is." You know, the beliefs yeah. all just came into being. Um, this was a long time ago. I mean, uh -huh. I was about twenty or whatever. Uh -huh. um, however, it's it's it changed everything, and then you you come straight back. So. So what I I didn't experience much except seeing myself lying on the bed, right? So I'd like to know what you saw like when you when you did you see yourself lying down and then what did you see after that, or does it really matter? I think it matters when you when you look at these near death experiences. A lot of people are spent half the talk describing. Uh, I was walking on the road and and there were two cars and, and all kinds of exchange and it's terribly important to them. And you think, really? And it's like hearing somebody else's dream, get to the itty gritty. But the, so I'll try and avoid all the build up and lead up the circumstances because they're incredibly important and relevant to me, but they're probably like someone else's dream. So it doesn't really matter. I found myself, I went for a nap one afternoon, one evening. I've been promising myself many nights to go for a nap. I lay down and um, I woke up either to my own alarm or to a text coming in and lying in the bed peacefully quietly, perfectly healthy, 49 years of age, 16th of May, 08, two days after bumping into an Irish healer guy. And um, suddenly my eyes closed tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter, like a rictus just totally involuntarily squeezed tight, not painfully, but squeezed tight. And I could feel the whole top of half my face being drawn into this, like a rictus, just con total contraction, and floods of tears flowing out of my eyes. And as this was happening, this incredible peace was, I didn't know what peace was, this was peace, was flooding towards me, just a complete letting go of everything. Um, Woody Allen famously said, I think, that his life was so boring, if he ever had a near-death experience, somebody else's life would flash by him. So my life had been so boring that everybody else's lives flashed by me, in a sense. First my own, which took just an instant. and um, But it was like 
some higher intelligence was showing me not every single minute event of my life, but just the whole gist of it. Mm -hmm. and, and saying how wonderful and I said that wasn't wonderful I said sure it was you did all you're asked to do and more kind of thing and I said what about the bits I'm ashamed of and said well that was only when fear overwhelmed you I said well yeah that was only when fear overwhelmed me just like everybody else said, yeah so this this didn't take a moment to this realization because the, the intelligence work then is so infinitely greater than our brains and just a moment of awareness of all this flooding in so the very first moments were absolutely incredible, just relief. And then the next moment was like every, every moment of relief that any human being had ever experienced was compressed into a nanosecond and handed to me. And then it was like every joy and triumph and gratification and pleasure that anyone had ever experienced was compressed into another and, and multiplied by that. And then the thing just became rapidly, they say indescribable bliss, but it just became accelerating at a more than exponential rate. This, incredibly indescribably deepening sense of peace and joy and bliss um and because my eyes were closed tight it was also as though i was like seeing stars and it felt to me i believed in the big bang i didn't believe in god uh, but it was like i was experiencing the entire big bang and um and in a in a vast accelerating way as though i was the big bang almost and experiencing every every particle and every moment of it and that it was all okay and getting more and more rapidly better and better. Um, there, were, there were no sights or sounds or visions. There was just like a, it felt like a complete communion, I guess, with every soul or being that had ever lived and a total understanding that they, like the ultimate therapy, like they understood everything I had ever experienced that I was handed to them. And they in turn all together were sharing all their experiences back with me in an instant. So a complete uploading of everything and an appreciation and a sharing. And um, in that moment, a kind of realization, I have nothing more to offer now. And, and the, a lot of people in these experiences are asked, do you want to stay here? Or do you want to go back or whatever? And a lot of them don't, don't want to go back and they're forced back. In my case, it was well, nothing else to offer. It's blissful, but I obviously need to go back. So, mm -hmm. so back away. And I had two more experiences similarly. Um, yesterday, Karina, I, I watched again um, a presentation by Hamish Miller, an Englishman, I believe, with a Scottish accent living in Cornwall who described his experience and he said that um, he was taken into a room and asked, did he work, want to work on these projects? And they were talking about something like the, the color of music. And it was way, way, way beyond his technical understanding. And he said, um, uh, I think I'm not ready for this yet. Maybe I should go back, do you think? And they said, yeah, maybe that's a good idea. So back he came to earth. So I think for many people it's like that. And I think maybe as souls that whether or not we pre-agree to the terms of our lives beforehand that we come back to learn more lessons and then upload them and that that goes on indefinitely indefinitely wow well, that is so beautiful and like i i have to ask the question is what changed when you came back did your perceptions did your perceptions change did you, your life change did you change your life did you change or, or nothing at all yeah, everything changed. It was like I was in um, physically everything looked exactly the same and it was like I was in a totally different universe. Um, Gilberti Taylor talks about like feeling like an infant in a new world and Eckhart Tolle, the introduction to the power of now, speaks about that like a baby seeing the world for the first time. Um, the, the incredible peace lasted very intensely for some days and gradually faded. Um, but the realization was that there, there never was anything to worry about and there never could be. So when you realize that, you're a totally different person. I had laid down to the nap as one of the greatest pessimists ever born. Um, Lincoln described himself as the saddest man on the planet, I think, Abraham Lincoln once. And um, I, was, I was a great pessimist. I was a very negative person. And having had that experience, uh, I woke up feeling like the greatest optimist who'd ever lived. Um, but the interesting thing, perhaps, is that you come to and you realize that there, everything is in place, everything is in order. There's a divine order that we can't appreciate. There, there is nothing to worry about, there never could be. 
and yet the mind, my mind, comes back on track and immediately says, there's nothing to worry about. Well, 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 well wow, that's, that could be a problem, you know? And, <laughs> yes. And, 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 yes. Well, it's certainly a problem for other people because they find it. Like, where, where, where's Tom gone? Who is this creature? He doesn't get it, you know? If you can keep your head when all about you losing theirs and blaming it on you, you know? Kipling knew what he was yes. talking about. If you don't see the problem, then you've really got a problem. We've got a problem. Hey, there, is, there are problems. You need to worry. No. You know how that works. We all know that. Works. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so it's not only, it's only not only your mind that makes you go crazy, but it's all the other people, you know, like what will the people say or what will the people think? And it's like I, I never understood who those people were. And slowly, slowly, I'm sure after an experience like that, you think, well, I don't care, right? <laughs> well, the problem is I didn't care a damn what everybody thought. I just wanted to tell them my thoughts. So I had exactly the opposite problem. I don't care who you are, what you think, what you believe. You need to know all about my story. So I, just, I just let them all have it. And that didn't go well at all. And it's still not going that well 15 years on. You know? So there you go. It's good to laugh about it. It's just weird. I know. Me. It's, it's, I know it's, it's, it's not fun. It's funny because um, I think we take life too seriously. I mean, especially after something like that, you, you realize that life is a game, right? It really is. And, and it, but it's very hard. And, and, and I don't want to, I'm not minimizing people's issues or whatever. It's not about that right now because it, it might sound like it, but that's not what I'm saying. It's, I'm saying that for me, I realize that um, I'm really so serious sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and and my mind makes me go crazy anyway. Um, and and really, it's um, just a game, and we need to just learn how to play it and 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 learn the rules along the way. Because who knows what the rules are anyway? Because did you learn any rules, or did you learn anything that that was different to when you came back? Like besides your perception, and you became totally different. But what about rules? And are there any? If, 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 if you and I said that what's going on in Israel or Ukraine or, or Syria or, or the famines of the world is funny and it's a game, uh, people would think us very callous people. And, um, and, and when you say that everything is love and everything is okay, you, you could be mistaken for the Antichrist and call the Antichrist. Um, that's understandable. Yes. And when you say, as I have said, that everybody was always doing their best, they say, what about Adolf Hitler? I say, oh, yeah, I'm sure Adolf was doing his best. And they say, oh, you're, you're evil. And I understand that. And then I think, wow, that's just the kind of talk that got Socrates into a lot of trouble. And yes. Jesus into a lot of trouble, too. It's very subversive to say everything's OK and everyone's doing their best. What about the evil people? You're saying the evil people are doing their best? That's evil. Oh, my goodness, lock him up. So, so Desmond Tutu is an extraordinary man. I keep coming back to him, when I, partly because you're South African. He said that the Christians came to South Africa, he said, with the Bible in one hand, and what did he say? They handed us the Bible with one hand, and and they took our food with the other. They took our something with the other. What is something famous like that? But still, he became a Christian Archbishop himself. We were left standing holding the Bible, and they were holding the land, kind of everything else, kind of. Yes. And, and still, he yes. became a. Yes. I'm I'm confused, but but when when I when I experienced this peace, which was the most exciting thing in the wide earthly world and beyond, um, I came downstairs after the first two experiences and I went on my laptop and I typed a colleague who told me that I should read Eckhart Tolle and I said, Catherine, I've just experienced the, the peace or a peace that passes all understanding or passes all understanding. And um, I sent off that email and then then and a bizarre thought came to my head. Why don't you Google blind and I'm Google blind? It's Google blind to myself, you know. I said, close your eyes and tap keys at random. I said, okay, that's, that's weird. I said, well, that's what you've just experienced is as weird as it gets, so just go with it, mate. You know, so I said, okay. So I closed my eyes and I tapped about 13 keys and I looked and it said a whole jumble of SDGA, LK, NDD, and I tapped word enter and it said no word match. And I said, well, that didn't work. <laughs> and then the same higher consciousness or something said, it's a lot of letters, mate. I said, yeah, it was. Why don't you try a few, like three, whatever. So I just closed my eyes again and tap three and I looked and it was comma XN. And the first hit that came up was peace of mind worldwide. And I thought, oh, 
Wow. I guess that's my mission, Peter. And then the whole, the first 10 of them were all relevant to me as far as I could see. The, the fourth said that it was a symbol of the early Christian church and it was pronounced Z-E-N. -Z and, um, and, and one after another, they're different now, of course, but each of them was relevant. And the seventh one said, international symbol for toxic chemicals. And um, within about six months, I found myself locked up and dosed with a whole lot of very toxic neuroleptic, neurotoxic chemicals. So that was obviously prophetic as well. And the reason I was locked up was because I went around telling everybody, telling everyone to listen more or less and to listen to me, you know. <laughs> Because I thought my mission was to spread peace of mind worldwide. And the way to say it was, hey, guys, there is a God. It's official. I went to bed an atheist and got up having met God. So there's a God, believe me. So, you know, they thought I was nuts. And, and I guess I was. And I guess I am. Um, a few weeks after the event, mind you, I sat down to have a kind of serious chat with God about it. You know, God said, well, Tom, how's it going? How are you getting on with the peace of mind worldwide? And I said, not oh, very well. I said, Really? I said, no, I haven't managed to get on even RT in Ireland or BBC or ABC or NBC or any of them, you know. I said, oh, I said, and, and, and you're not cool with that? I said, no, of course I'm not. At this rate, it's going to take me longer than forever to, you know, people are being born faster than I can save them because I can only meet people one at a time. At this rate, it's going to take me longer than forever to save the universe, God, you know. And God kind of said, Tom, did you have any better plans for longer than forever? And I no, I guess not. So, <laughs> so, so at least you know when there's humour, the truth tends to pop out. What, what would you rather do for the rest of forever? You know, one planet at a time, one universe at a time, one person at a time. What does it matter? I mean, right, all right. And then I can change that um, because first of all, I have to just go back and say yes um, to say that life is a game. I, that's it's it's not it's not meant as a callous. Yes, of course. And about what's happening. It's, of course. It's just a, a, a metaphor, right? Yes, yes, yes. That in good yes. context for yes. our viewers. Yes. Um, so, so for that, I, like I was going to say, at the, who was it? It was Gandhi or whoever said um, that they say he said that like last that you need to change the world. You have to change yourself, right? First, and maybe that's what God was saying, like peace. Peace for you first, Tom, and then you, it'll just um, reverberate to the rest of the world. And then what about the the people who say, well, at the end of the day, it's it's only it's we are God, right? And ah, I don't know who said it. I remember a vision of this. Someone once said that. If, if, if we are all one and we are all the same person. So the only difference between us is that we look different. But if we if we if we take it to a higher level, we'll realize that we're all looking at each other in, in the mirror, right? I mean, we know that, right? Absolutely. So, so then again, um, you're looking at you have to find the peace within yourself so that it can reverberate and then you'll find the people that that bring in the peace by mirroring whatever you're doing at that moment i know that's like such a long-winded thing when i'm <laughs> so now nah, that's what i'm saying to you is do you think that's what god was saying to you It was kind of grandiose to say that I even met God. You know, it was myself. When when I had the flashback of my entire life, it was like I'd been wearing this camera, a cop camera on my, all the time. And the observer and the judge was, and a lot of people said, the only judge was me. I looked back and judged yes. my life. And I found that with this loving presence, I couldn't condemn myself. And when I couldn't, I couldn't condemn anybody. That area is, oh my goodness, everybody's overwhelmed by fear. And, and I can take any favorite politician, Desmond Tutu, Adolf Hitler, Putin, Zelensky, Netanyahu, any of them, and say, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me, that guy in the traffic who just, that's me. Oh, my God, that's me on a bad day. That's me. It's all me. And, and um, look at Viktor Frankl in, um, in the most humanly talk about game of life there he found himself victor frankl in that concentration camp separated from his wife whom he'd never see again because he'd made the decision on a whim to stay and honor his parents he found himself in the the worst situation any human being could really imagine i think the hunger and yeah. the cold was just a tiny part of it and 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 by by turning out and trying to help other people he he saved 
he saved his family, he saved himself, he changed his entire world just by changing his attitude. It may or may not have been the same concentration camp he was in, whether there are parallel universes or an infinite number of, of concentration camps that look the same and that he glides between them, who knows, it doesn't even matter. But by changing his attitude, like you in your detention, or me in my detention, when you change your attitude, the doors instantly fly open. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes, yes, I love that. And, and uh, that's exactly true. So you change your attitude, your life changes. And even though you'll wake up in the morning and you think, oh, you know, I'm feeling so great, but my life's still the same. But is it really? Because you're different. So things start changing within your world. And you only realize afterwards, like, wow, you know what, when I made that decision or when I changed, when I opened my eyes to that, look at all the, the doors that have opened because I saw them opening at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, so, mm -hmm. so I love that, um, that vision as well. That's really very cool. And, and we go back to Viktor Frankl and, and, and like, I, I cannot compare my experience to Viktor Frankl's, not only on, on any level, right? But for my experiences was like, as soon as I changed my mind, and instead of looking at myself and thinking, oh, this, I'm so scared, and what will, I, what will happen to me, and what will happen to my son, and what, 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 shame, 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 cry, cry, cry. And I started looking out there and started helping others and realizing that everyone was in the same situation and, and in worse situations than me, because they couldn't even understand the language or they, they didn't understand, at least I understood something and I went out and I helped them. Everything changed as well. So um, it's again, it's like sometimes we just become so self-absorbed that <laughs> we die without even realizing it. So what do you think? The thinking, like Tolle says, we're addicted to thinking. Um, <laughs> yes. The, the um, so you lost me there. I'm not a good listener when I do. My brain shuts down the other part. Shuts. When I start listening, people often say, Tom, are you okay? Are you okay? When I stop talking, people say, are you okay? <laughs> when can, can we change? Because I, as you began to speak, I began to think of one of my absolute favorite movies is Michael with John Travolta, The Archangel. You know, it opens with a gorgeous song by Randy Newman, Heaven is My Home. It's directed and produced and I think uh, part of scripted by the amazing uh, Efron sisters. So uh, big way Jewish production. And Randy Newman, uh, that opening song, Heaven is My Home, uh, the, the, the chorus is, you got to open up your heart, you got to open up your heart, you got to, but sometimes that can be extraordinarily hard to do when you're overwhelmed by fear and circumstances to open up your heart and to get rid of the fear is, is just not possible. <laughs> and you, you can be, a little bit aware that you are struggling and that you can't open your heart and that you are overwhelmed, but but it's got such a huge momentum sometimes that it just overwhelms you, I think. And I think it's in moments like that that people do extraordinarily awful things, um, um, taking the lives of themselves and others when they're totally overwhelmed. Um, but that that thing that overwhelms us, um, whatever it is, the pain body totally calls it, I think it's ancestral and it's enormous. And I think it's um, it's something we grapple with and Gandhi said that too, that the demons are running around our own hearts and that's where we have to fight them or, or contend with them or confront them or recognize them, whatever, every day. Um, and when we do, we become the change we wish to see in the world and the world changes with mm. us. Or at least one universe at least seems to change with us. So the real question then is, I think, how do you open up your heart and how do you change your attitude? And, um, and one clue I think that Tole gives is he says that we we can he says that we can create the space for grace to enter um which like most of what he says kind of <laughs> rings true um when 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 we've suffered enough i guess to realize that that we can go on suffering forever if we choose to uh, we can go on worrying forever if we choose to there's always something to worry about but at some point when we realize that if we really want right now we can begin to try and put the brakes on and stop that fearful mind. And when we do stop it, the space opens and then the grace can pour in. Um, and I grace, the grace is always there waiting to pour in, isn't it? Mm, mm. Yes. 
Yes, and a lot of times um, it, it, to stop the mind, because it's the mind that, that causes the suffering a lot of times um, with, the, with the crazy stories of like, wow, I, I, can t I can take one little thing like this and I can create a beautiful story. I suppose it's my author mind, right? And I can create this intricate story and, and in my, my head. And, and, and a few days later, I might connect with that person and speak to them. And it's totally like, what are you saying? You know, like, what, what, how do you allow your mind to just run free like that? But on the other hand as well is if we look at that and we look at where it comes from and we, and we, and we find the source of, of, that, of that fear or those ruminations, then we can release a whole lot of things as well. And, and then again, we also, it gives us the opportunity to open up and open our hearts and see that uh, and break the chains of the past that you want to break so that it, it gives you freedom for the future. So I think... I think that's what you were saying, right? Your newsletter talked about the kid on the harness, a recent newsletter, reaching for the trash. Yeah. She had a piece yes, of trash yes. she wanted to throw in the can, was that right? Right. Yes, and her mom, yes. whether her mom was looking at other kids or oblivious, her mom obviously wasn't letting her get to the trash can, right? So she yes. couldn't quite, yes. and her face was contorted into an inhuman expression, you said, of frustration. So it's, Yes. Everything is yes. right there. And on what one of the things, I don't know if you went that far, but if she had got to the trash can, presumably she would have dropped her piece of trash in. Would she have pulled out more garbage? And did her mom know that? And, and isn't that what we all do? Uh, the beautiful book, Johnny Sano, The Divided Mind, he's about psychosomatic medicine. He was the founder of it, I suppose, John Sarna. And Howard Schubiner speaks about it. And Freud mentioned that when you cure one neurosis, another one tends to pop in. Yes. So you cure chronic pain, they become depressed. You cure the depression, some chronic backache manifests. And, and 2,000 years ago, apparently, this Jesus guy, if he lived, which I believe he did, said, be careful when you drive out one demon that it doesn't go away to the dry, arid place and bring back seven. And when your house is swept clean, the seven new demons reinfest you and your situation afterwards, he said, is worse than before. And he, said, he may have said it laughingly, but things don't change. When we get rid of one piece of garbage, there's a vacuum. If there is a vacuum, nature abhors it. We suck in a whole lot more. And I can't speak for Jill Bolte Taylor, but I know that after my experiences, I should have been the most amazingly charismatic and loving being who'd ever graced this planet from there on out. And I most certainly am not, by the way. <laughs> and I might have been for moments, or even for days, maybe for for days after that, I felt I felt in such a bubble of extraordinary peace and joy that I felt I only had to look at somebody to catch their eye to heal them, you know. And and for all I know, maybe maybe some of these people who are who seem to be on the same frequency, they just look me in the eye and think, oh God, another angel alien, another another, and and this extraordinary blissful communion with souls as I'd walk through a, a crowded train station, some people, another one, uh, and this instant connection, and say, oh my goodness, they're everywhere, they're all Christ, oh my God, oh my God. Um, but that faded, unfortunately. It didn't seem me for Eckhart Tolle much, but it sure, sure did for me. Uh, it faded a lot. So what happened that it faded, and how could you have kept it? Did something change? Um, and, and I know that's like might be a rhetorical question, right? But what happened? Because if Eckhart Tolle still got it, he's like radiant. And so, what happened to you that you lost it? Um, and maybe you didn't. Well, thank you, therapist. Uh, Tolle said that he sat around, I think, on park benches for five months solid in a state of sublime bliss. He might eat a meal every two days, perhaps. He lost his position, his home, everything. Park benches in England, I think, cold. Um, five months, and uh, that after that he said it faded or it seemed to a bit because it, maybe it didn't really fade, he just got used to it. But um, <laughs> yes. he, yeah, he said that sometimes the dimmer is turned up higher, and um, he said that some people, sometimes people feel it, you know. Um, so, what happened? Life. Tolle has a nice point too, and I often think of it. He says that if, if, we, um, if we arrived in heaven in the morning, our ego would probably kick in and say, is this all there is, you know, or <laughs> I don't deserve this yet, or there, there would be some problem, you know, um, as long as we have the ego. So I think the ego likes to create problems. Um, there's, 
I, I, I love the funny story in the Bible where Jesus supposedly, not long after being in the desert for 40 days, if he was, came home to his own um, people and preaching in his own temple. He um, He's applauded by the gracious crowd for his gracious words, and then he goes and spoils it all by saying something extraordinary, like you may say, physician, why don't you heal yourself? Why can't you heal people in your own hometown? And he rebukes them by saying, but a prophet is not without honor. So he's apparently sabotaging himself there. Go figure. Um, I think we're so familiar with SHIT that we, we tend to come back, the old mind kicks in if we're not watching it, and it immediately does what minds do, is they say, you need to worry about this, that, and the other, and we believe it like idiots because we don't have enough presence, or I don't have enough, I didn't have enough presence awareness. Uh, Tole obviously did, I obviously didn't. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. And then, and now, of course, presence, because we always talk about the present moment, because that's all we have, like, especially now, that's the only the thing that exists. What about now, I'm going to take it to maybe a different level, maybe from out of the spiritual, for the want of a better word, um, into like self-belief, because it's self-belief uh, and, and self-love makes such a difference in the way you see things like for me, um, and I'm sorry, I keep putting it up to me because it's my experience. That's the only way I can exp explain it. Growing up, I always like I had the whip was as big as as long as a whip can be. That self hatred was horrible. The the self abuse was horrible. I mean, I was never good enough. I was never pretty enough. I was never anything enough. And of course, as you grow up, you realize, well, hey, you know, but it's such a big process to realize that if you had to throw that whip away and realize that you are. You know, you can't be that terrible if God made you, right? And, and you know, or, or the universe, or whatever it is, God made you. So, how do you do develop that that self belief and realize that? Um, and did you ever experience that in your life? Um, my parents were most parents, I guess, opposites attract. A lot of parents are opposites. My parents were extreme opposites. Um, everything I did is, in my mother's eyes was 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 sublimely divine, pretty perfect, incredible miracle that I that I managed to tie a shoelace. Just well done, <laughs> lovely. Uh, just and my father was um, naturally enough, and the more she did that, I suppose, was all disapproval. He he didn't approve himself, and he was a perfectionist, and you could feel it. So of course, which which parent are you trying most to please? The one who's disapproving. And, yes, and of, of course, course. When, when girls have a dad like that, they often, very often end up marrying a man like that because they, they've on finished work, they have to prove to daddy that they're good enough. Even as a child, I realized that if I became a professor, which is the highest form of life, or a dean of Harvard, my dad would say, isn't the dean of Yale slightly higher? You know, I just knew that there was no pleasing, no matter what I achieved, but yet I was programmed, no matter how much you suffer, it's not good enough. Catholic Ireland yes. too. So I still have his, not his voice, but but I have this judge. I can't get rid of that judge yet. But to be slightly aware that it's there is a help. Something else that helps me a lot, I think, is to think of a wonderful Englishman called Richard Maidley, who told an extraordinary story on Irish radio. And um, I'm sure he'll forgive me if I, if I, if I get any details wrong. But his father had been abandoned um, in Britain. Long story, very dramatic story. His grandfather had been his father's father. And when Richard was about nine, his dad had this habit of taking him out to the woodshed, whipping off his belt and lashing him for no apparent reason out of the blue. And I guess Richard understood he wasn't to tell his mom whether or not his dad said anything. But Richard was an extraordinary young man and he found the courage to tell his mom. And his mom, who was Canadian, I think I told you the story before, his mom was a very extraordinary lady. And um, she, she explained to the son that the father's issues were because of the abandonment that his grandfather had suffered. And um, she said to the son, you can choose to forgive your dad now that you understand that or not, but either way, I'm with you, whatever that meant. And Richard said, I chose to forgive him, he said, because I guess of the extraordinary help that his mom was offering him. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, psychically. Uh, he said, I chose, and, and in that moment, he said, of oh, forgiveness, I could feel the, the forgiveness rippling back the generations, he said. And when he said that, I, I, I know I told us, shared that before, but when he said that, I, I don't know if he mentioned that if he understood that the forgiveness stopped with the grandfather or went rippling back the further generations, because fathers and fathers, every father wants his son to be better than him. 
and every son wants to be better than his dad. And most of the time, of course, with male egos, uh, fathers have tended to be abusive emotionally of their sons by expecting them to be better. They whip them um, one way or another, emotionally or if not physically, and they disapprove of them. And they think that if they got more discipline, and if they'd got more discipline themselves, they'd be better men. And they don't realize that if they'd actually got more love, they'd have been stronger, better men. So that 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 male ego thing, I think, perpetuated on the millennia, has led to a, a crazy world ruled by men and ruled by ego. But I do firmly believe that it's very, very rapidly changing now. And I also believe that when you hear this judgmental voice, it's not a voice, when you feel this heavy mood, or maybe it's your back pain or your neck pain or your tinnitus acting up, when you feel the darkness descend on you and the negativity, and it may be aches or pains or fatigue or depression or some physical manifestation, when you feel that come over you again, when you realize that this is ancestral stuff handed down and that when you deal with it, that you can deal with it for so many people, then, then it makes it worthwhile trying to deal with it and shine your light on it. And as you know, I think when you just shine your light on it, it's, it's dissipated. Yes. Tra not just yes. as it's transmuted to something wonderful, isn't it? So, yes. so being aware, you think is this is never ending. Will this voice ever stop? But it stopped for others and presumably it eventually stops for all of us, right? Yes, yes. Um, and we and we just have to learn uh, to learn to 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 not judge ourselves as harshly. And it's quite interesting how sometimes you can not judge others as badly as you judge yourself. Um, it's like, whoa, stop it now. So it's it's a constant battle as well to 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 throw away the garbage like I mentioned in the in the, the quest this week. It's like just throw it away. You just carry all the stuff um, of things that you think you said or things that people did or whatever it is. And instead of just looking at it and shining a light and seeing, well, maybe I can learn from that. Or why am I carrying that? Why can't I just throw it away um, and help that little girl throw the garbage away, but not take any more out? Actually turn around and play in the, in the, in the sand and create something beautiful. Yes. So... Now that we've gone totally off this, let me go back to uh, my, my, my statement about yes. having the, the fear of death. Uh -huh. uh, so again, like I was saying, in, in, and probably in the, in the full conversation that we've had up to now, for me, it's not about the fear of death as much as a realization of the fear of living a, a beautiful life and experiencing life and experiencing the beauty of it and experiencing relationships and everything about it. So if we fear death, then um, it gives us almost an excuse not to love life. Mm -hmm. What do you think? So do you agree with that statement or what do you think about that? There's any number of ways of taking that, Karina, and, 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 and then there's the way you intended it. Um, Shakespeare famously said, cowards die off before their death, the valiant only tasted death but once. But if we're immortal souls, then the, the souls who agree to incarnate as, as cowards and to die over and over are, would, in a sense, be the bravest souls, right? So the, um, when you were speaking a little while ago about um, being as God or the universe created us or as we are, um, Growing up in Ireland, we understood that created meant made from nothing. It has other meanings as well. Um, so in the beautiful book, Don Quixote, Cervantes puts the words, these wonderful words into the mouth of Sancho Panza. He says, and for we are all as God made us and many of us much worse, or and frequently much worse. It's the same thing, I think. Um, so yeah, I don't know if Sancho Panza said that with his tongue in his cheek, but I'm sure Cervantes did. If we're created mm -hmm. from nothing, then and given this free will, then whatever we do with our free will in this, it's all divine anyway. How could we possibly do wrong? You know, If we're tempted and, we, and we, we go for the apple, we were created with the susceptibility to do that for God's sake. You know, A child can see that. And, and the irony is that when, we, when we're convinced we can do wrong, we're gonna get nervous and make mistakes. When we're convinced we can't, we'll actually make far fewer mistakes. So 
the Apostle Paul, and I took Paul for my confirmation, is forever, as far as I'm concerned, saying all things work for the glory of God through those who wish or something. You know, there's, there's always the kind of condition, if, you know, it'll all be okay, if. Um, and, and a lot of religions say there is only one God, but some people say, no, there is only God. If everything is God, and if everything is okay, then and only then can we totally trust all the time with our hearts. And then and only then can we feel, now is an excellent time to stop this mind because I have forever. When you think time is limited, you're always in a rush and time is money and money is time. And we can make mistakes and it's all tied up with the fact that there's only so much time and only one lifetime and we have to get it right and we're afraid and we're very afraid. And who makes us feel like that mostly? The people we're, we, we, we're obviously come into this world to respect, older siblings, parents, teachers, clerics, authorities. Uh, the devil in the, the serpent in the tree telling us, you're good, but you're not good enough. You're never, ever good enough. You're never good enough. Ever, ever, ever. Get used to it. Yes, yes. Ever. You're yes. not got to try harder. And the harder, and that's, the, you know, in Ireland they say the hardest, the worst boss is yourself, the hardest person you can work for is yourself. Because we don't set the bar any higher for other people, Karina. But of course, we tend to set it higher for them. Achieve <laughs> yes. that, but obviously, you can achieve more than that. Just try. You tried your best, yeah. Well, your best can be better tomorrow. Try harder. Try harder. Try harder. I asked one very, very wonderful retired lady doctor recently, Jewish lady. I said, "What is the meaning of life?" And she, without a moment's hesitation, blink, she said, "Not to try so hard." <laughs> why, why didn't I ask you a long time ago? Not to try. So hard. <laughs> Yes, yes, I, I agree with you totally because it's like always, it's never good enough. So you, you do, you're like, do this, 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 and this. No, not good enough. It's not good enough. You need to get up earlier. What are you doing? Why did you sit and read a book? Or why did you go for a walk? You should have done more. You should have done more. You should have done more. And, it's, and when you sit back, you think, what are you doing? What are you doing exactly? Um, and maybe uh, on some level, that's death, right? Because what are you doing? You're killing yourself over what? So um, I, I like I like her her meaning of life. It, it makes a lot of sense. Can I tell you another one quickly? <laughs> yes, please do. When I was five years in a feed store, I kept asking perfect strangers, the only perfect people on the planet are the perfect strangers, what is the meaning of life? <laughs> and one guy said 42, you know, and I, it was, I got some great answers. But the best one, maybe, equal best, was the guy who said, do the next best thing. I think I told you that too. Do the next <laughs> thing. He said it so, so, so joyfully, so laughingly, that it obviously wasn't do the next best thing. It was obviously... <laughs> <laughs> don't do the best thing you know and I thought oh my god that's what I was that's how God created me always not to do what I think I should be doing but do the don't resist the apple take the apple and figure it out take later. The apple. I thought, oh my god I was meant to make all those mistakes why didn't he tell me that a long time I always do the next best thing I was meant to do the next best thing yeah Tom that's that's the only way I could get you to clean the house give you a really difficult essay to write oh my god you're smarter than I am God aren't you well <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that because it's really true. And 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 then we go again. You like you were talking about the resistance. <laughs> it takes me for some sometimes. You know, it, it, for me sometimes it's easy to drop this quest every week. And sometimes it takes me a whole week. And, and I resist it as well. Instead of just going like, you know, stop the resistance. Just write something, <laughs> and then you'll feel better. Like, what are you doing? And so take that garbage off your shoulders of resistance and just or, he, he, give yourself he, 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 a bit of leeway. This might help you. You know, when you come to the States from probably South Africa and you see it's all the news, the news is commentary mostly, you know, that, that's OK. That's what they want. It's entertaining. But but my yes, father yes. loved old school dad, loved to boast about the good old BBC. You know, one o'clock, 1946, the news at one. And the guy comes on and says, today there is no news, you know. <laughs> Nothing worth saying. You know what? You could try and meet him one week, say, hey, guys, this week's newsletter. <laughs> Blank page. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the greatest poem in the English language might be from a Republic of Conscience by Seamus Heaney. You know, Amnesty asked him to write something for their 25th or some, some of 70th anniversary. And he tried and tried and tried something really wonderful and uplifting for Amnesty. You know, tried and tried and tried. And finally, 
sorry, he wrote letters and I think, sorry, you, I, I don't want to waste it. You need to ask somebody else. And, and that same day, he writes back and says, actually, since I wrote you earlier today, something came. You know? <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. I want a poem. What a beautiful, and that poem says it all from a republic of conscience. You know, it's just it says it all. It to me, it says it all, and it means something entirely different to everybody who reads it. Probably every time they read it, what a poem! That's the way it's supposed to be, right? And um, and and just as you were saying that, I always it made me think about what what we feel the most we get all the time, um, and maybe um, writer's block is one of those things, but. Whatever you fear, you it'll, it'll it'll just manifest. It'll come. So watch your thoughts and watch what you fear. <laughs> That's a really scary thought, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse the pain. <laughs> really scary. I love it. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so oh, I love this conversation, um, <laughs> Tom. As usual. So on that note, just give I me mean, a last thought about. Um, the fear of death and the fear of life. No, I won't. Sorry, and... I refuse. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, you're the, you're the boss, but I can't do that. But, but well, maybe I can, maybe I can. I watched, <laughs> you know, countless, countless, countless near-death experiencers give their stuff when I discovered them on YouTube recently. And I'm all a gog, what did they take away? And one wonderful woman, she was either on Jeff Mara uh, podcast or on Thanatos TV, the German Thanatos. I think it was Jeff Mara. And she said... Um, I just realized that when I experience all that loving, bliss, blissful love, that unconditional love, that obviously I just needed to come back to earth and share it with everybody. And I thought, oh, there's an idea. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Instead I love that. Ideas. So, so that, was, that was her idea. And I mean, she, sorry, and maybe, I don't know, maybe that is an answer to your question, fear of death. I, one thing, anyone who's had what they call a near-death experience have, is that is that they if it's genuine i think or if, if they have it in common with genuine is that none of them is afraid of death afterwards and like me they may be very afraid of of not giving their all that can be scary not to share everything that you could i mean how do you share that love with everybody that she experienced or that you know and and if you're trying too hard <laughs> then fear has got in you know it's just but um so 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 fear of death, what if there is no death? What if we go on and on and on and on and on? Um, one interesting little thought um, for a guy who isn't a Christian, I love to quote these Christian pastors, Tutu and others. I did see one Christian pastor on the internet who suggested that all our human ideas of heaven, paradise, nirvana, down the ages that our culture has soaked up, those ideas may have been given us down the ages by people who've in all eras experienced these near-death states, whether it was of hell in some cases or of paradise, and come back and said, this is what paradise is like, guys. So theoretically, the, it could be lights out when someone pulls on our lids and our heart stops. But um, <laughs> you know, and I know it's not, and that consciousness is not tied to the body. You know that from out-of-body experience. You know that it's not. And, and I think one of the little clues that it's not is um, those extraordinary, that would be another talk maybe, lucid, um, not lucid dreaming, terminal lucidity, when people's brains are turned to mush, perhaps, and they still come back completely lucid minutes, hours, or sometimes days before they die. That, that also is a clue that consciousness is not tied to our brains, and that, that every human being, I suppose, suffers from a neurosis, if you define neurosis as the process of nerves creating thoughts. Um, we're all neurotic, of course, but, yes. but we all have an awareness of that to some degree. And that awareness is not a brain thing. It's higher and it's not tied to the body. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's a good way to end this. And But before, before I'd like to just add, uh, first of all, the only way we're going to change, to love everyone is to love people like, and I'm talking about unconditional love now, right? To just spread the love as you go along, right? With a smile or whatever you do, right? Smile, hugs, and, and show people that they mean something. For me, that's what I think. So, okay, and I've just lost my train of thought. So if, I think on that note, 
<laughs> it's a great thing to do. <laughs> Lose the whole train. Way to go. Way to go. <laughs> so instead, I'll say celebrate life. So go out, enjoy life, enjoy the flowers, enjoy that you're alive and just do like Eko Tolle, just enjoy the moment because that's all we really have. And stay away from things that you fear. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. This was a beautiful conversation. And thank you, you to much. everyone who's listening and watching. And tell us your thoughts about what you think about this conversation. I know it might have been a bit out there, and hopefully it didn't trigger anybody. But it's just thoughts, and I think your comments will be beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for, every, for, for being here. Thank you for the conversation. Bye, everyone, and see you soon. <laughs> Bye for now.